Good. Hey, good morning. We're here at Cascadia Church, and you're here watching us, and we appreciate that. We have checked in, we've prayed, we've said hello to one another, and we're ready to begin. We are starting a brand new series this morning called Route 66. Uh, this is a series I taught decades decades ago, I guess, a long time ago. And I thought it would be a good idea to go back and take a look at this series. Uh, we are going to, as you might be able to see, it's a, it's a book a week journey through the whole Bible. There are 66 books in the Bible, and we're going to take a look in the weeks to come. Probably going to take us a couple of years because there'll be little breaks in between. We're going to look at every book of the Bible. What is in it? Why was it written? Who wrote it? When did they write it? What's the message for us today? So that will be, uh, I think, a pretty good journey for us. Every week I'll also include outlines and handouts. I'll provide that online so you can download that if you want to. And the first one here, if you, those of you who are here with us this morning, we want you to be able to pick that up. And it's just got a list of all the books of the Bible. It's kind of a roadmap for where we're going. Uh, in in the near future here. So uh, last week, Joanne and I were out of town. We were on vacation. Steve Crane filled in for me again, and he did a good job. I heard great reviews uh, from several of you about Steve. He's a good Bible teacher. What I thought, he's a, he's a great Bible teacher. What I thought was interesting is that I talked to a couple of people. They focused on a different dimension of his message and said this was, I think, the most important part of what he said. And I would anticipate hearing what I heard from somebody else, but it was somebody, something completely different. So uh, Steve is good, and uh, thank you, Steve, for helping out again. We appreciate that. Joanne and I were out of town uh, because we went to my uh, daughter's, my favorite daughter's, wedding reception. She got married in November. When did she get married? February, close. February, I, right here in my notes. I should look at my notes. February in Tacoma, she got married, uh, but it was a COVID wedding, so there were just very few people there. Uh, my new son-in-law, Michael, his family all lives in Wisconsin, so we went to Wisconsin and had a wedding reception there, and we had a lot of fun. Prior to going, uh, we, Joanne and I visited several states in the Midwest. Our destination ultimately was up there near Madison, Wisconsin, a little place called Lake Mills. But we, we left a week early and did some driving through seven, I think seven different states, maybe six, looking at some of the places where Joanne's ancestors lived. And she's got uh, some well-known people in her family. Uh, Sergeant York, if you've seen the movie about Sergeant York, he's in her family. Hannah Boone, Daniel Boone's sister in Joanne's family. Uh, and I am by marriage related to Barack Obama. But you couldn't tell, I mean, otherwise, you know. Yeah, by marriage. He's like 58th cousin, 17 times removed, or whatever it might be. Anyway, I digress. Uh, our ultimate destination was in Wisconsin. And you might be able to see there's these little dark marks on the map. Those are all the places we wanted to visit. So with the, with the assistance of an app, a computer app, it, it plotted for us the most efficient route to take in order to see all the places we wanted to see, all the places we wanted to go. And uh, we had, with the help of this app, we were able to plan that route and we had a moderate degree of success. This time we batted about 500. There's some places we just couldn't get to, there's some places we couldn't find, there's some places we didn't have time to get to because we did other things instead. But a map, if you've done any traveling, I know that all of you have, uh, is very helpful because it's gonna tell you some things. A map is going to tell you where you are, and a map is going to help you determine where you want to go, and then most importantly, how are you going to get from here to there? That's what a map does. That's what a road map does. That's what helped Joanne and me have just a great time away last week. Now, the Bible functions as a road map for life. It's God's road map for living for us. The Bible tells me where I am in my relationship with him, and sometimes in relationships, often in relationships with other people. Uh, the Bible is going to tell me where I need to go, ultimately where God wants me to, me to be, not only in this life, but in the life to come. And then he's going to tell me also in the scriptures how to get there, how to get from where I am to where he wants me to be. Now, um, 
uh, in our new series, <coughs> Route 66, there are 66 different stops we're going to make along the way. We're going to look at a variety of the books of Scripture. There's 66 books, as I said. And we're going to stop at each book week by week and look at the big picture of what each book of the Bible is about, the message and the meaning for it. And today it's an overview. It's an overview of the Bible. It's an introduction to the scriptures. And uh, we're going to take a look at the Bible as a whole. And then starting in a couple of weeks, we are going to look at it book by book next week. Listen carefully. We will not be in, here in the building. We'll be at Jim and Kim Hart's home for our annual church picnic and outdoor service. So we'll mention that at the end of the message today. So here's, here's just a little bit about where we're going to go. There's a handout that I've made available for you. It's similar to what you can see or maybe cannot see on the screen. The, the type and the font is rather small just to get it all on the same screen here. But the Old Testament... I just want to give you an introduction here. It's divided. Well, the Old Testament was written before Jesus was born. And it's divided into three major sections. The first section is, are 17 historical books. They talk about just general history of the nation of Israel and some, to some degree the world. Then there are five books of poetry. And then there are 17 books related to prophecy. And you'll understand what each of those books are about in the weeks and the months to come. Here's a fun way to remember how many books are in the Old Testament. If you spell out the word or you see that phrase, Old Testament, spelled out, you see the word old has three letters, Testament has nine letters. You put the three next to the nine, you get 39. And there are 39 books in the Old Testament. So now you'll never forget. So the next time that comes up on a, you know, you're driving through a, a uh, you know a coffee stand or whatever there's a trivia question how many books are in the Old Testament which you'll never see but you'll know the answer just in case it ever ever pops up some of you may not know this but the Bible was not written in English it was written in other languages yeah Dennis welcome yeah uh, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and some of it in Aramaic and Hebrew and Aramaic share the same alphabet just like English, French, German, Spanish. Those are completely different languages, but we all use the same alphabet, other languages as well. So in the Old Testament, all the letters look like this. This is Hebrew text. Uh, and it is Genesis 1.1. And if you were to translate it, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So that's what the Hebrew looks like. And it reads... So if I can do this correctly, from right to left, from right to left, from top to bottom. So you would start up in that corner and you'd end up down here for the end of the verse. That's the Old Testament. The New Testament was written after Jesus was born. The Old Testament tells us that Messiah is coming. The New Testament tells us that he has arrived. And here is what he did for us. And here's what it means to know him. And in the New Testament, there are four major sections. Uh, the first four books are called the Gospels, and it's the biography of Jesus, so to speak, just a short biography of his life, his death and his resurrection. There's a book of history, how the church started and spread throughout the world. And then there are 21 letters. Some of them are letters written to churches. Some of them are letters written to individuals. Most of those letters are written by the Apostle Paul. The rest of those letters are written by people other than the Apostle Paul. And then there's one book at the end of the scriptures called Revelation or The Revelation or The Apocalypse, and that's a book of prophecy. So you take this word, this phrase, New Testament. You've got three letters in New, nine letters in Testament, three times nine is 27, and that's how many books are in the New Testament. So don't get those mixed up or you're gonna not be able to get a 25 cent discount on your coffee if they ever ask that question, that trivia question here for you. The New Testament was written in the Greek language, and this is what Greek looks like. This is John chapter one, verse one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
That's what we'd read if you were to translate that into English. So, here's a couple of facts that I think are important for us to understand regarding the scriptures. I think you can start filling in some notes on your, uh, your bulletins that you received this morning. The Bible was written between 1500 B.C., that was the book of Job, and the year A.D. 90, the book of Revelation, written by more than 40 people in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and then Greek. And there is not one error or contradiction in the Bible. So even though it's spread out over 1,500 years, 40 different writers, three different languages, no errors, no contradictions, no inconsistencies uh, within each book or from book to book. Now, (laughs) watch the news this week on two or three or four different channels, and the same story will contradict another story. Well, if if two or three channels are going to report on the same event, you will hear completely different perspectives, perhaps, and sometimes even conflicting information. Just like, just think about COVID info. Who is telling the truth? And what are the facts? Who knows? It's so confusing. It's not the way it is with the Bible. It's consistent. It can be understood. It can be applied. Sometimes it's easy to apply. And sometimes it's quite a challenge. But we have help. We have assistance. Uh, through God's Spirit who lives within believers who helps us to understand God's Word and to live it the way that He wants it to be lived out. So God has given to us His Word, the Scriptures, and uh, we call that the Bible. We call the Bible the Word of God because it contains God's words. God speaks to us in the Scriptures. And so the Bible is the main way, it's not the only way, but it's the main way that God speaks to us. It is, the Bible is the ultimate authority in our lives and for our lives. So I want you to, I want you to think about this. No matter what somebody says to you about anything, if it contradicts what God says in the scriptures about whatever topic it is you're discussing, if somebody is saying something, doesn't matter who it is and doesn't matter what they're saying, if it's contrary to the scriptures, the person that's speaking to you is wrong. Because God is right. God is correct. He always has been, always will be. So let the Bible speak to you as you read it. And I'm going to, uh, I've done this my entire ministry. As I'm teaching from the scriptures, don't take my word for it. Look at the scriptures yourself. Look at what the Bible says and ask the question, it's the responsible thing to do. Is that really what the Bible says? You have the freedom and the responsibility and really the obligation to not take my word for it, but look at the Bible for yourself and ask yourself the question, is that really what the Bible says? So the Bible is a roadmap for life. I thought I had another verse here or slide maybe it'll maybe it'll show up here in a minute but let's just talk for a moment about how the bible came to us how did how did we get the bible and the the verses that i'm going to show you illustrate how the bible came to us it's it's these are not verses that tell us exactly how the bible came but it illustrates the process So an illustration is something that is similar to what we're talking about. So I just want to show you some verses that help us to understand this process. First of all, how did we get the Bible? First thing is people talked about the things God did before anything was written. Before the first word of the Bible was ever written, people talked about the things that God did. Here's an illustration of that, Psalm 78, verse 4. We will tell the generation to come... The praises of the Lord and his power and his wondrous works that he has done. So from generation to generation, parents to their children, grandparents to their grandchildren, whatever that might be, they would talk to one another and pass along to one another from generation to generation all the things that God has done and done for them. Next, prophets, men chosen by God to speak with authority for him, said what God told them to say. And that's illustrated in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord spoke through me, and his word was on my tongue. 
So when a prophet was filled with the Spirit of God, and they spoke for God, they spoke with authority, and they spoke with accuracy on behalf of God. And then the prophets wrote down what God told them to write. They, put, they made a written record often of their prophecies, of their preachings, and preaching and sermons and so forth. Jeremiah 30, verse 2, reads this way. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Write all the words which I have spoken to you in a book. And so they would write down uh, these prophecies, these words from God. So they not only spoke them, they also wrote them. And then copies of the prophet's writings were made. Here's an illustration of how that happened in Old Testament days. Joshua chapter 8, verse 32. There on the stones, Joshua copied the law of Moses, which he had written in the presence of the Israelites. So once Israel crossed over into the Jordan, or across the Jordan into the Promised Land, one of the first things Joshua did was made a copy of uh, the scriptures for the people to have. And then finally, translations of the copies were made available. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. They read out of the book of the law of God, translating and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was read. Now this illustrates uh, why we have so many different translations of the Bible today. So people will understand the meaning of what God has to say to us. As culture evolves, so do word meanings. The word awful used to mean full of awe. I remember hearing a story about an architect who was designing a cathedral and the reviews were coming in and said, it's awful. It's terrible. Why? Because it instills within you terror, whole reverence toward God. That's what terrible used to mean. And awful means that it, it just stirs within you a sense of awe. Now you get reviews today on something you're creating or designing, they tell you that it's terrible or awful, it means something completely different. So word meanings change as culture changes, and so translations of the Bible need to change as well because of the, the word meanings. Now it doesn't mean that what God says to us has changed, but it's how it's communicated, the words that are chosen to convey the message that has changed. So that's one of the reasons we have a variety of translations in the Bible. People sometimes ask me, what translation of the Bible should I be reading? And I say, whichever one makes sense to you. It, really the thing that I, uh, I want to see more is that people are reading their Bibles. Uh, some translations are better than others, it just depends on what you're looking at. I've mentioned this before, I use a variety of translations every time I study. Sometimes I use a variety of translations as I teach. Whatever verse <laughs> makes the point that I want to make <laughs> is the translation that I'm going to use. All right, so there we go. That's what I was, this is the verb, uh, slide I was looking for earlier. The Bible is a roadmap for life. Uh, it tells us where we are. It tells us where we need to go. And it tells us <clears throat> how to get there. And so uh, that's where we're going to go. Uh, here in the balance of our time together in the next 10 minutes or so. We're just going to look at these three final points. They're in your bulletin, so you can fill in your outline because I know that you want to do that. So uh, let's take a look at each one of these final three points. And here's the first one. This is, the Bible tells me where I am. The Bible tells me where I am. If we read it, God's going to speak to us and he's going to talk to us about our present condition. It's amazing that the Bible is alive it's metaphor, which means that it's active, and God uses it to speak to us dynamically even today. First John 5.13 reads this way. These things, which is the book of First John, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that, here's the reason I wrote it, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So First John for the believer, for those who know Jesus Christ, they're reading this book and it's affirming that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ if what is contained in 1 John matches your life, or at least if you're moving in that direction. So to the believer, to the following, followers of Jesus, 1 John is, is telling 
those people telling us, affirming to us that we have eternal life. Now, what is 1 John saying to the person who does not believe? It's saying the same thing. It's saying, well, it's saying a different thing. The opposite thing is saying you don't have eternal life. You don't know Jesus because these things are not true in your life. So the Bible is going to speak to believers and unbelievers alike. And the same content may have a different application. So in 1 John, the application for the non-believer is that you don't have life. Because this is not true for you. But for the follower of Christ, as we're reading through 1 John, we should be getting affirmation after affirmation after affirmation that, yep, this is true, or this is the direction I'm going, this is important to me, this matters. Those are all affirmations that we have eternal life. Now, if I were to ask you this morning, if I were to go around table to table, chair to chair, and ask each one of you, are you certain that you have eternal life? If, if you, well, well, first of all, don't answer out loud, but just what would you say? Are you certain? And if you were to say yes, I would ask you the question, how do you know? How do you know? Why are you certain that you have eternal life? Could you, could you answer? Some of you might say, I don't know. I don't know if I have eternal life. Some of you might say, I know that I don't have eternal life. I know that I don't, don't know Jesus. Well, it could be any one of those options. Those are, the only, those are the only three. Either you know you have salvation, or you're not sure, or you know you don't. Now, you may think that you do, but that might be a false, false thinking. I thought for most of my growing up years, uh, some of you are wondering if I've grown up, uh, most of my growing up years, I thought for sure that I was secure with God, and I found out, in my 18th year that no I'm not because I didn't know Jesus I needed to know him and that changed my life completely once I came to know Jesus when we're finished today we're going to pray together I'm going to give you an opportunity to to be sure that you have eternal life to be certain that you know God through Christ so only the Bible is going to tell us how to have eternal life only the Bible is going to tell us how to get to heaven and how God wants us to be living day by day until we get there. And so God is going to, first of all, speak to us about our spiritual condition, our relationship, or lack of relationship with him. Number two, the Bible tells me where I need to go. The Bible's going to say that. The Bible's going to speak to us if we read it and if we want God to communicate to us through his word, he will. Psalm 119, 105 says this, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And this, of course, is a metaphor. I mean, the, you can't hold your Bible down on the ground and it's going to be like a flashlight for you showing you where to walk in the dark. This is a metaphor. It's a figure of speech indicating that, as David King David wrote these words, indicating that God is going to guide us in our life. He's going to help us in our decision making. He's going to show us what we need to do when we have to make a decision. He's going to give us wisdom. He's going to give us guidance. He's going to help us to know where he wants us to go. And in the Bible, we find instruction, for example, on how to handle our finances. In the Bible, we find information about how to resolve conflicts. We learn how to raise our kids, how to have a better marriage, how to respond to an unreasonable boss, uh, what to do about corrupt political leaders and hundreds and hundreds of other topics. It's like uh, uh, a, f a friend of mine says, the Bible is like Prego spaghetti sauce. Remember those old ads? It's in there. Remember those old commercials? It's in there. What about this? It's in there. What about that? It's in there. It's in the scriptures as well. So the Bible is loaded with wisdom. But we have to tap into it. We have to open the book. We have to read it or hear it. Uh, to gain the wisdom to know where God wants us to be going. And as we journey through Route 66 together, looking at each book of the Bible over the, the months to come, uh, we're going to be extracting from it many life principles. Here's a significant theme in this particular book of Scripture, and here's how it works out in our life, in our living today. Final thought number three is this. The Bible tells me how to get there. The Bible is going to tell us not only where we are, but where we need to be, and then finally how we're going to get to where God wants us to be. 
Psalm 119, 133 reads, guide my steps by your word so I will not be overcome by evil. Yeah, they, listen carefully. This is, this is so simple, but we miss it often. The only way to end up where God wants us to be is if we do what he wants us to do. That is the only way we're going to get to where God wants us to be is if we do what God wants us to do. There is no other path, period. We have to do what God wants us to do. How do we know what he wants us to do? You need to get your nose in the book. Sounds simple. It is basic. But not every person, not every Christian lives as though they really believe that, that it's really true. Some don't. I want you to see in this verse that it's evil that can cause you to wander off the path where God wants you to be. Do you see that? Evil. It's real. It's out there. Uh, There are plenty of things to distract us, to divert us, to discourage us that ultimately will destroy us. Things that will keep us from following God fully and completely. We call that the world, the flesh, or the devil. And the world is, <laughs> is uh, not a place that wants to honor God. The world is hostile to God. Uh, you know, those of you that live in the real world, and, and most of us do, uh, the pressure that's put on us uh, to, to compromise spiritually, to be like the world. I spent some time uh, this week in a, in a, with a group of people I typically don't spend a lot of time with, most of them non-Christians, and just the culture for those two days was very different than the world I typically live in. And it was a good reminder for me to know that uh, I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. And that's how God wants us to be living. But the world wants to distract us and pull us off course, away from where God wants us to be. The flesh, there's the world, the flesh, and the devil. The flesh is the problem that you have with yourself. And it's a problem that I have with me. It's natural for us to be selfish. It's natural for us to want to do what we want to do rather than what God wants us to do. And that's why Jesus said that if we're going to follow him, the first thing we have to do is deny ourselves. We have to deny ourselves and then follow him. Finally, the devil, the world of flesh and the devil. Um, the devil is real. He has one goal for you, and that is to be distracted. That's the only thing he wants. Distracted. He wants you to live a spiritually compromised life. And listen carefully. He doesn't care if you're a half a degree off. Because over the course of time, a half a degree makes a big difference. He's patient. He'll wait. He'll let you wander. And so that's why we need to be in the Word, God guiding us, so that we're not overcome by evil. Important information for us. Okay, so here's our takeaway for today. This is it. The Bible is my roadmap for life. It's my roadmap for life. That's why we're doing Route 66. What is this path that God has paved for us? What are the markers along the way that show us that we're where we're supposed to be? Uh, If you get out on the road at all, we're talking physically driving a car or whatever, and you look at the map and you see the signs around you and they're not matching, something is wrong. And it's usually that you're not where you're supposed to be. So you need to make a course adjustment. And that's what the Bible is all about. So uh, this journey that we're talking about called life and the roadmap that God has for us that we call the scriptures comes together only when Jesus is your driver. You cannot be in the driver's seat and successfully end up where God wants you to be. You cannot be in the driver's seat and be where God wants you to be, even today or tomorrow or ultimately. There has to come a point in your life when you say, I, resen- I, I uh, release control of my life. I'm going to step out of the driver's seat. I'm going to sit in the back seat. I'm going to let Jesus take over. And that's one way of illustrating what salvation is about. One way of illustrating what denying self looks like and following the authority of Jesus Christ. 
So as I said before, we, as we began, uh, we're going to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus, to put, let him be in his rightful place, the driver's seat of your life. And then uh, Ashley's going to come and she's going to lead us in a few songs as we sing. So let's pray together and then we'll close up this part of our time this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving to us uh, your word, the Bible. Thank you for its completion. Thank you for its perfection. Thank you for uh, the, the clarity that you give to us if we will be diligent in seeking to understand uh, what you have given to us. Thank you for those that teach us. Thank you for the way that we can be taught and learn and make the adjustments required to be where you want us to be so that we can end up where you want us to ultimately land, so to speak. And God, I'd mentioned this morning that we want to give people an opportunity to know for certain that they have eternal life. It's the most important thing in life is to know that we have life eternal. Because not one of us, we, we hear on the news every day about people, and we'll hear about it tomorrow, people today who died unexpectedly. They had no idea that today was their last day on earth. And uh, sadly, uh, many uh, today who will not be here tomorrow are not ready for eternity. So we need to be ready. And to follow through on this metaphor, Father, it's about allowing Jesus Christ to become our driver. And, and it's certainly a lot more than that. It's this idea that Jesus came here to earth perfect and lived perfectly and by choice went to the cross uh, and took our sins with him so that the consequence, the penalty uh, for our poor decisions, our lack of responsibility, our just sometimes just straight up defiance uh, can be punished because it needs to be. There needs to be justice. There needs to be consequences. And Jesus took that for us. And Father, you tell us in the scriptures that anyone who will affirm that that is true, who will believe and say yes to what Jesus has done for us at the cross through his death and his resurrection, can and will be forgiven and will have the gift of eternal life given. The Spirit of God will come to dwell within and everything is transformed and the process of following you begins and never, ever ends. So Father, for anybody who is listening and wants to make that affirmation with you right now, that you know their heart, you know their intention, you know their desire, and as they're speaking to you privately in their mind and in their heart, hear what they're saying to you as they say, yes, God, I want to receive Christ as my Savior. I want Jesus to take my life and take control. And I want to deny myself and follow him and learn uh, to live life the way that he wants me to live the way that you want me to live. And with your help, I will follow your son and I will seek to please you for the rest of my life as you receive me into your family and ultimately receive me into your presence when this life has ended. Father, thank you for the time together today. And we dedicate to you in advance where we're going on this journey be our driver, be our guide, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's say goodbye, and then we're going we're gonna, to uh, turn off uh, Facebook, okay? Say goodbye.